Alrighty, so hello everybody and welcome to the art show and this week we've got our special guest uh, John Navarez and uh, yeah he's going to be joining us and uh, drawing some uh, some cool stuff in Photoshop and uh, yeah talking about his kind of career and and uh, so uh, hello answering... everybody cool. and welcome to the art show and this week we've got our sp- and answering questions um, for you guys so yeah so if everyone if you just want to write your questions in the chat um, yeah we're more than happy to answer any questions that we can during uh, during the show so Maybe just um, for for any students um, or people tuning into the stream that that haven't uh, kind of seen you before, John, just want to give a really brief rundown of what you do and who you are and all that stuff. <laughs> sure. No. So first of all, Simon, thanks so much for inviting me to to the to the show. Uh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I'm John Navarez. Uh I've been in the industry for 23 years. I started in '97. Uh, I started in Disney TV as a storyboard artist, and then eventually made my way to doing uh, visual development and background design. Uh, and then I've been lucky enough to do like TV shows, started on, on uh, one of my first shows with Pepper Ann, and then I bounced over to the direct videos where I did um, Brother Bear 2, Tinkerbell, then I jumped over to Astro Boy, then I uh, was lucky enough to work at Pixar for five years, uh, worked on Cars 2, Inside Out, Monsters University, Coco, and then I, uh, then I got laid off from Pixar, and uh, we were supposed to go to LA, but then my wife and I decided to uh, to just stay because we were kind of rooted in the Bay Area. My daughter was in school, and we liked the area, so we decided to give freelance a go, um, and it was awesome. So the first gig I did was Angry Birds movie, and then I worked a little bit for Google. Then I worked on and Sony uh, on the Spider-Man film, and uh, worked on the Emoji movie. Uh, worked for Warner Brothers, where I was on the Scooby-Doo movie, and I did a few other things in between. But uh, yeah, I've been working remotely in the Bay Area here in San Francisco for about the last six years. So and yeah, and I love it. So, um, and so aside from all that, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do personal projects. I teach a lot on the side. I, I mentor a few folks, and I'm uh, trying, I'm been kicking the can on this book. So I'm hopefully going to finish this book soon. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And you do like kind of storyboarding work plus viz dev as well? I have, yeah. I'm mostly right now I'm doing uh, background design or set, set location. But um, every now and then I do like, uh, I'll do like freelance on the side. I'll do like, I'll, I'll be working on two things at once. And sometimes it's just like a small storyboard assignment or, you know, something for a commercial or something like that. Cool. Ah, yeah. that, that sounds good. <laughs> it's good. I'm, I'm just lucky they, they, they call me. So I, and it, I love it because I get to bounce around. I mean, I love doing design, but I also love boarding. So um, I like to bounce around because I get energy on one and I try and feed it to the other. And it kind of keeps things good, you know, the way I'm going and things interesting and stuff like that. Yeah. And so you mentioned that you kind of started freelancing not, not um, super long ago. Was that, because um, we like to always talk to students about this, was that kind of like a scary experience when you left the safety of a studio going into freelance or you found your feet pretty quick? No, it was, it was, it was scary uh, because I have always had the comfort of working in-house and we always have production managers. You know, these are, those are the, the managers there who kind of tell you when things are due, your schedule, uh, your to-do list and so forth. So when I had to work from home, that all fell on me. And I'm the worst as far as time management because I didn't know how to do that. So the first nine months, I hated it. And, you know, I came really close to like, oh, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. But then, uh, you know, uh, good friends of mine who I, who I kind of approached as far as like advice on working remotely, uh, Steven Silver and uh, Pascal Campion, you know, they were just saying like, no, it can be done. And, um, you know, I just kind of just, Basically, you know, it was just, it's basically simple. It's like what you need to do is just kind of set a plan or, or, or a calendar or a schedule and just, just commit to it. And it might change. You might flub. You might, you know, things, things can change. But you do your best to keep it. And so you build a routine. And that, after I kind of got the, after, you know, I was just trying to apply it, it took, it got better. And then, then it got really good where I actually was having, I was enjoying working from home because I found like I had more time to be with my family. I had more time to do my own stuff. I had more time to teach. Uh, I had more time to travel and, and do other things. And, um, and then I loved it. And I don't really miss studios at all. Um, 
I miss working with people, but I don't miss all the politics. I don't miss all the all that <laughs> stuff. I mean, it, for me, it's, it's just the work, and then I turn it off, and then I do my own thing. So, you know. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, I, I'm so. I guess generally in the in the uh, the art show sessions, yeah, we just have we have our guest artists just just draw some stuff and and, and do um yeah just sketching around and doing whatever they want to do. So do you want to share your screen, John, and you can um and you sure. can sure. Let's see. And here we go. So cool. So um, let's see. Should I just draw whatever? Thing? Yeah, for can sure. I just reform. All right. For sure. Um, you mentioned you're doing a book at the moment. What what's that? What's that that you're working on? Uh, it's a it's a, it's a cat character, so he's kind of like, um, you know, has adventures around the world. He's kind of, um, you know, he's just kind of, it's kind of like an artist at heart. You know, he likes adventure movies, and he's a fanboy. And, you know, he just has a vivid imagination, and he just kind of gets lost in his, in his world. So, yeah, I'm just kind of riffing on what that could be, so. And is it like a yeah. com- is it a comic or a graphic novel type of thing, or more of an art book? You know, I'm kind of treating it like a, an art book for a movie that hasn't existed yet. Okay. So uh, because I, because I'm kind of familiar with that because I you know um, I'm used to doing storyboards and and you know design. So I'm thinking like, okay, I'm just gonna stick with what I know and just kind of you know start ripping on possible designs of what that could be. You know, maybe the things the people he'll meet, maybe he'll. he'll be out and about in a market and so forth and maybe he's looking at somebody maybe he'll meet interesting people along the way you know maybe he's in Europe maybe he's at a market maybe this guy is, has a loaf of bread or something like that he's gonna maybe try and buy it and so forth you know, I don't know, maybe there's a card there are there loaves of bread And then I'll just kind of, you know, right now I'm just thinking about uh, adventures. What I like to do is I kind of, it's, it's an exercise that I do as far as like composition and so forth. So, you know, I, what I usually do is when I kind of do is I do small thumbnails and I just try and create little little compositions of what he is. I, you know, this is my scale for what he is. Maybe he's at an altar like at Indiana Jones. You know, I have the foliage here. Maybe it's a foreground tree. Maybe here, there's a big, huge relic of a cat, maybe. Jungle setting and so forth. The foreground is lumps of fern, trees, and bark and so forth. Maybe it's one of these, like maybe it's like uh, the Angkor Wat where it's a courtyard that used to be uh, a temple and you have these broken bricks. You know, maybe the roots are just overgrown, they're taking and so forth. So that's kind of what I'll do. I'll just kind of riff and just kind of just go for whatever it is. And whatever I sketch out, I just try and like, okay, well, it's what trying to accentuate the focal point. So, you know, it's usually where the cat is, you know, he's the important thing in the piece. And another uh, secondary piece is what he's looking at or, or what he's focused on. So then I'll just kind of really quickly just kind of paint out what that can be. Maybe this ruin is in shadow, so maybe the top part is really dark. The mouth in shadow, and so forth. Maybe there's a cat shadow behind him. So, and then I'll kind of say like, okay, well maybe I want to go wider. Sometimes I'll recompose and I go wider, and then maybe you know I'll flesh out what that could be, and then maybe I'll add another element, maybe in the foreground here is. Uh, but also this guy, maybe there's a secondary explorer looking in. And you're looking at all this. So it's fast and dirty. It's quick and messy, but that's okay. I'm just thinking with a pencil and I'm just drawing it down. So with this, you know, I can kind of like, okay, I can just keep it here and I just kind of just keep on ripping. So it's like, okay, I can stay with this moment and I could be like, okay, I could be a cinematographer and find out what are the compositional possibilities of that one piece. So I have this piece. Maybe I want to do a piece from like, okay, maybe it's from the top of the stairs. Maybe here's the grid of the floor. 
Maybe here's the, the, the teeth of the temple. So the camera's inside the mouth, looking out. And then maybe here is the cat looking up. back and maybe I can add the brick in it's all broken and staggered you know because because it's ruined you know maybe because of earthquakes and so forth everything is just kind of broken and earth has overtaken things the roots come in and raise the bricks and so forth maybe there's broken statuettes temples and so forth these blocks you know I just keep things simple as far as shapes you know, I'm not cleaning things up right now. Right now, I'm just thinking, having fun, finding out what this could all be, so forth. I definitely think sometimes this is like a, a part of the process that some students get really tight in. You know, like they sometimes just like do one and then that's it and don't necessarily explore all those different options. Uh -huh. That's true. I think they kind of lock in on one and uh, you know, I kind of, this is what I kind of saw. Uh, I would always see, when I went to Lightbox and then CTN, uh, I was lucky enough to see a lot of student portfolios and I was, they would always ask me for, for portfolio reviews and I was always happy to do it. And I always saw this, I always saw the same thing. I always saw like one story moment where it was just a little guy fighting a big guy. It could be a monster, a dragon, a creature, a dinosaur, or just a big hulking creature. But I always saw that, and that was the one piece they had. And I was like, oh, that's beautiful, because that's all they had. But what I was encouraging was like, OK, what would be nice is as a storyteller, you want to kind of tell us more about what's happening in this moment. You just took one snapshot. So it's like, well, what if you were actually in this piece, and for the next few minutes, you could walk around with your iPhone and like kind of figure out you know, what's the, what's the vantage point from behind him? What's the vantage point from behind him? You know, what if there was a two shot and so forth? So, you know, it's kind of like, okay, maybe it's behind over the shoulder. You so kind of tell us you're more. behind this guy and now this guy's towering. So that way you're playing up with, with size and scale. He's so big, he's filling the frame. You know, um, maybe another shot would be, okay, maybe it's it's the, the, the big creature, and now the camera's behind him, and his tail whips and so forth. And there's his claw, and then right here, you have the character, the other guy right here. So now what I'm doing is I'm playing with... Um, I'm, I'm using metaphors. I'm trying to enclose this hero in small spaces as though he has nowhere to go. So I'm kind of using composition right. to kind of further showcase the story and maybe kind of maybe underscore the predicament of this guy. Okay, he's closed off. He's got nowhere to go. Plus, this big, huge guy is just looking down on him. Uh, maybe I could open it up to like, you know, it, it, right, all these previous shots I did were standoff. They're just looking at each other. Well, what if? You know, the character actually maybe, you know, started to take off. And now the creature is in fast pursuit. Like that. Uh, that's one consideration. What if you move the camera so maybe it's more over the shoulder? So maybe it could be over the shoulder where maybe the camera is underneath that guy and he's pursuing <laughs> the guy like that you know that's a consideration and then shadow over the ground again I'm kind of using that metaphor of composition to enclose him in that space another possibility could be where maybe i'm going to touch the camera anytime Things are stable, things are flat. But anytime things are kind of instability, where things are action and moment, people like to dutch the camera. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to dutch the horizon. Here's my VP. And maybe I'm going to have the guy, our hero, kind of taking off. And he's like, oh, no, you know. And then I have the big guy 
right on his tail. You know, maybe this big claw just crashes in and things are just kind of flying up at the momentum of this, of this step. So basically what I'm doing is I just kind of, um, I'm just throwing the camera around. I'm thinking like a camera. I'm being a cinematographer and I'm, I'm just kind of throwing the possibilities of what all this could be. And this is just further showcasing you as a designer that you know composition, you know how to, you know, staging, you know how to really kind of storytell or kind of amplify certain moments of a story. So. That's cool. And we got a, we got a question from Rosie, John. Um, what yeah. are some good films to study for storyboarding? And what are your top tips for getting better at composition? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, as far as movies, I should, you know what? Uh, I mean, I always tell people Indiana Jones is always good for composition. Uh, even uh, Close Encounters. Basically, any Spielberg movie is really good for composition. Jaws is really good for composition um let's see i know i know there's gonna be a whole bunch after i <laughs> after this whole podcast i'm gonna like totally riff on and i have no one to riff it too, but, but um but yeah Spielberg is always a good choice to start um let's see now as far as like composition exercises um one thing you can do and this is just uh simple and boring is like okay do the can exercise the can exercise is like, okay, picture there's a table. Now here's here's the floor, and this is a side view. So you have a table, a simple table, and you have a can, like a can of Pepsi. Okay. This is called the can exercise. Okay, now um, now this is flat. So what you want to do is like how many compositions can you get? If you move the camera around and you can also free yourself up and move the can. So from above, maybe this can is right here, or maybe you can move it here or here anywhere, but ask yourself, what are the possibilities? So I'm just going to quickly riff and I'm like, okay, what if we're on the top looking down three quarter and this can is right here. Okay, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. But now, what if we do this? What if we put the camera here and we move that, that we move the table and the cam's right here? Now, right away, what does this say to us, maybe emotionally or with information, versus what this is saying? Okay, so basically, this looks like. You know, this is like neutral. It's like it really doesn't say anything. It's like, okay, it's just somebody on, on the top of the surface. But here, this almost looks like somebody is looking down and maybe about to jump, or it's just kind of like looking at whatever it could be. Okay. Now, what if we move the camera so it's lower? Okay. Like, say we, we you know, we bend down and we see the table. There's the leg. And then the there's the can. And what if, we, what if we add a little bit of the lift like that? All of a sudden, it's a hero shot, which is kind of very much like a, a hero shot when you're looking, when someone's looking down at camera. You know, it's a hero shot. Yep. Plus, it looks like they're about to jump or leap and so forth. Uh, what if we did the same thing, same composition, but now we have, instead of the camera sitting up, what if the camera is like there and we have a shadow? Then all of a sudden, it feels like it's, it's vulnerable, like it's about to fall off and so forth. Um, what if we... What if we put this... The camera, what if the camera is directly right above the table, and then we can, say, amplify the shadow. So, you know, maybe there's a flashlight here. And then like, so you get the shadow. Uh, so it becomes like a cowboy showdown. So it's like the camera's from above and you're actually reading the shadows of what that could be. Um, what if the camera is really low? Um, you're, now the camera is on the table and the camera's flat and dead center. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But what if we do this? What if we... 
camera so low that we start to distort the scale. Again, it becomes like the, the can is more than just a can. It's, it's, it's very, you know, the scale, you're, we're pronouncing the scale. Mm -hmm. and now it's like someone who is more of an authority figure. It's someone to, to reckon with, so forth. It, it can become a villain or a hero. It's a hero shot, that kind of thing. So basically, this is just a simple exercise on, on just how you can get the, the possibilities of, of just a can on a table. Now, once you do that, <laughs> then there's also the two people shot. And this is another exercise. The two people shot. You have one person here and another person here. And just to distinguish them, this guy's wearing black. So now, how many compositions can you get from there? Now, you can kind of like get over the shoulders. Here's the guy dressed in black. Maybe here's his ear. And then here's the guy here. Okay. And here's have some grid lines from the sky so we know guy okay what if we do that versus this shot this guy hasn't changed so much but now this guy is filling the, the frame all of a sudden this guy in the foreground is encroaching on this space so emotionally or psychologically this guy is in power or so to speak he's taking room away from who he's looking at so now, if we wanted to use this as a story moment, we can play up this guy's performance. Maybe, you know, he's kind of like, I'm drawing so small, let me just, maybe, he's like, you know, he's trapped, he doesn't know what to do. And maybe, again, this could be a guy who's kind of looking like, you know, over the shoulder from his ear. Maybe we do the same thing over the shoulder, but we're doing it over the hip. So now he's kind of like, maybe this guy is got his gun on the holster. You know, maybe we play up another way of saying that. And then we do this. What if we, the guy on the holster, you know, here's the gun. Here's the Levi's. Here's his gun. His, and now... Now we, again, we've used composition to enclose them in the space. So you kind of even use shape to help help you tell the story. Yeah, you know, composition, shape, how you stage things, and then adding performance. You know, because you're kind of showing acting and reacting to what, what in the context of what they're of what of, what, of the space that they're in. So, you know, someone who is in. Um, Change that. It's black. You know, performance really helps as far as you know what what the person is feeling or acting or thinking or, or reacting to. So you know, someone you know, they'll have an over shoulder shot. There's this person here, and if this person is kind of like, you know, maybe he's kind of like, oh, you know, he's kind of laughing. It's like, oh, you, you know. It's like, okay, it's a comfortable zone. Maybe he's just kind of reacting to this guy. Maybe he told a joke or he has some funny face. I don't know. But what if we take this guy out and now maybe we had a wall, so we have a shadow. So it's like he's got nowhere to go. He's trapped. Now all of a sudden this person is not so much neutral. Now this guy could be an aggressor or um, someone scary, a monster, uh, you know, has some shadow behind him and so forth. Now he's got, he's, he's a different person than what we, than what we, than we, we had seen based on this person's reaction. Mm -hmm. So it's performance. So I tell people, you know, when I, when I talk to, to groups, what I usually do is like, you know, think about the performance, think about the composition, think about the lighting, and all of these, you're going to give an experience. You're going to give a moment. And that is, in a way, your storytelling. You know, someone doesn't have, you know, it's okay if you kind of, I mean, there's points when you want to have someone that's neutral, when it's just kind of like doing the Jesus pose and they're just kind of still. 
But what helps is if they're really reacting to something, you know, use the body language, you know, use the eyes and the shoulder and, you know, maybe are they crouching? Are they buckling up? Are they tense? Are they open? You know, are they like, you know, they're free? You know, are they, you know, it's, are they relaxed? Um, composition, you know, how are they filmed on the screen? You know, use foreground elements, uh, background elements, um, you know, Maybe it's a two shot where the camera equalizes both parties. Um, it could be a two shot. Maybe this guy's here, and then this guy is now. Maybe he's a bigger guy, but we're pressing this guy. Maybe he had a wall. So now, all this negative space just kind of helps amplify that this guy has nowhere to go. He's got such a small space. So, um, yeah, and then lighting, you know, lighting, not just lighting for day or night, but lighting, how do you light emotionally? So, um, usually, say you have someone here, things that are brightly lit and you can see them and you can especially see their eyes, um, you know, they're usually safe, maybe neutral. So, you know, right away, it's, we don't really have anything to, to, to suggest the feeling. You know, what if, see, sorry about that, blow that up. But what if we start to have a shadow over the person's face? All of a sudden, they're now kind of coming, maybe they're coming from the dark into the light, and then that in itself can have a different context, like maybe they're now being brave enough to come out of the darkness into the light, or maybe they're going back into the darkness so that they're scared and they're seeking shelter in the darkness. Not sure. Uh, but, you know, we've seen this in movies where, you know, you use the lighting to suggest, um, you know, what type of people they are. You know, uh, if you can see faces, it, it, when you see someone's eyes, they're not hiding. But when you don't see their eyes, then you kind of don't know what they're thinking. You don't know what they're feeling. So uh, that's an element how of light. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly that changes, <laughs> how it, it changes does, the yeah. read. Yeah. Exactly. It's just kind of, let's see, let's see if I can find a, uh, uh, I should have brought this up. Um, maybe, maybe we can talk about something and I'll bring up uh, maybe uh, some examples. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. We've got, we've got a few other questions. Um, sure. One question is, uh, hi, John, could you please talk about portfolio musts and mustn'ts? <laughs> so do's and don'ts for portfolio. Yeah, I uh, see. Uh, sure. Okay. For portfolios. Get my thing here. Okay. For portfolios. Uh, okay. So what you want to do is you want to, you, you should basically, uh, the portfolio should be job specific. I mean, it, it has to be said because a lot of people just kind of, they don't, it, it, sometimes they put a lot of too much stuff in it, and it's not really telling the recruiter or the studio what job you're applying for. So basically, if you're applying for storyboards, well, you should it should be either 80-20 or 90-10. 80% should be what the job you're applying for, and 20% is supplemental. Or it could be 90% of the job that you're going for, or 10% supplemental. So if you're going for storyboards, it should really be beefed up for story, and then maybe 20 could be design or graphic design or whatever. Uh, again, for visual development, it should be 80 or 90 percent vis dev, and the other could be storyboard. So uh, you, you want to make sure that you're showing what you want the job for. You don't want the recruiter to make that choice because if you are relying on that recruiter, I mean, if you have so much good stuff and you're relying on the recruiter to kind of make that choice. They're going to probably make a bad choice and they don't have time. They're, they're, it's going to go in a pile of like, they don't know where to do with it. So that's the one thing. Be job specific. Um, let's see. Um, I would say try and don't put too much stuff in it. I think if you can tell yourself and try and start with 20 pages, start with 20 pages of stuff that you want to do. Um, and from the 20, you can actually add a little more or take away a little more. The reason I say 20 is because right away, if you look at someone's portfolio, pretty much in the first five pages, you know what that person is capable of doing. And you know the broad, you, know, you, you have like a, a broad strokes of what, of what they can do, what they can do, and their style. 
So if you go for overkill and put too much, no one's going to really have the time to look at all that. And if there's anything weak in the back of that, it's going to weigh down all the good stuff. So I would say start with 20 pages and so forth. If you're doing storyboards, I would say try and, if you can, put in three sequences. You know, three sequences are just, you know, three short stories, three short scenes of which you can accomplish. And as far as how much a scene can be, um, you know, there really isn't a, a finite number, but I would say try and maybe make it 50 panels per sequence, you know, or more. Um, I would say showcase something that you're comfortable in. As far as storyboarding, if you're comfortable doing dramatic uh, sequences, then just put dramatic sequences in. If you have a flair for action, definitely showcase action. Uh, if you're more of a gaggy person and you like comedy and can showcase that, definitely do that. But I would say do maybe three different sequences. Yeah. Oh, thank you, baby. I'm sorry, my wife, my daughter just gave me some hot chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Um, now, as far as design, I'm going to showcase. I'm going to bring up a. So I, I got a question, John. With the um, with like the storyboarding stuff, um, I'll let you do this. With, with, oh, this, yeah, with the storyboarding stuff, um, do you think that studios pref prefer to see like an animatic these days or just like flat boards? As far as storyboards, um, this is what I suggest. Uh, it's great if you have an animatic because, you know, it's the plus is like you're taking the time to add uh, dialogue and sound. If you, have a, if you have a good animatic that's clear, yeah, definitely showcase that. Um, I know a lot of people do this. Let's see, Ray Lusso. Uh, story. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, uh, is it here? Mm -hmm. The images. Where's my images? There. Ah, okay. I know a lot of people. They have like a. Um, they have like a. Well, you know how Blogger used to have a right click, left click um, feature. I'll put in mine, and uh, mine's are really bad. Uh, sorry about this. So where is my? So what's really nice is um, it's nice when you it's it's a lot easier for someone to view it when you have some kind of a right click feature. So yeah. uh, if if you have this, it really helps because it, it it first of all it magnifies each panel. And so you can focus on each panel at a time and just right click. So I call this a poor man's automatic. So, <laughs> you know, you can just quickly, not quickly, but at your leisure, right click through and you get a sense of progression. You know, you can stop and study the scene, so forth. So, um, you know, I know um, some of the features, I think Wix might have this, but you might have to put in a plugin, like a, a blogger plugin. Mm -hmm. Let me just use blogger. Blogger's still free. Uh, and a lot of people use tableaus. Tableaus are nice where you kind of have, um, you know, maybe 16 to a page. You know, and you go four down. So, you know, these are just called tableaus. Yeah. So if you don't have an automatic or if you don't have a, like a right-click feature, you can do this. Uh, you just want to make sure it's not so small that somebody has to squint their eye. Um, because if things are so small, and if there's subtle changes in your board, we can't read it. You know, you're going to be like, you know, someone's going to be looking at, at, at your portfolio, like just really closely and they're not going to be able to see all those subtle changes. So I would say do, you know, maybe 20 to a page if you're going to do a tableau. I think, let's see, I think um, Nira Liu has, um, Nira Liu is a story artist and uh, let me see if he has any bookmark. Uh, yeah, artist of Pixar. Yeah, so Nira has some good tableaus. Oh yeah, cool. So, yeah, so yeah. yeah, so so this is like this is a uh, let's see four by five twenty to a page. So it's not so small, but you can definitely see as you right click everything there. So there's different ways to showcase. An animatic's great. A tableau is great. Uh, if you do the the right click feature via Blogger or something like that, that's great too. Uh, it's all about um, you want to make it user friendly, and um, that way the the 
the recruiter or whoever's looking at it can easily write, you know, can, can go through the homepage, look through your board, and can navigate through without kind of going through so many gates to open. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And the same thing can go for design. Um, I always tell folks about this uh, three, where, nowhere land. I always recommend this one. Uh, I like Brandon Wu's portfolio. This is something he did in, from 2015. Um, I like this for two reasons. It's great presentation and great content. So if you, this, this has like 28 pages. If you include the first page and the last page, which are its covers, so there's actually 26 pages of art here. Um, let's right click through. What I like about Brandon is right away, he's got three, at least three little sequences of stories in here. This is his first page. He has a nice lineup of characters. You know, what's great is that, you know, some are in neutral poses, some are in their poses that showcase a little bit of personality, you know, great style. And then from there, he showcases another page of expressions, poses, explorations that further kind of tell more or less who this person is. So right away, we have like a young warrior, you know, he's, you know, action, you can kind of see he's playful here. This is a, he's in mid pose jumping over something. Here he is, you know, battling like another creature. And, and so forth. So right away, this page really shows us the personality and persona and, and just kind of who this person is. Okay. And then. And then, is that uh, kind of what you meant before where, where you want to see the exploration of the, of the character and the poses and, and the compositions you even? You do. Yeah. Cause if you want to be, if you want to be a character designer, you want to showcase that, yeah, you can do a character. But you're responsible for creating the lineup. You're, you're, you're responsible for creating the cast, designing the whole cast of the show. So what helps is doing a lineup. So right away, in one in one page, we kind of kind of have their dynamic to each other. We have scale, you know, how big they are to each other. And then all of these one pages here of exploration. This is just one page of this one character and who this is. Um, if you go further on, this is an exploration of the of the bad guy. But then. Uh, but you want to have different pages that show make, that showcases more expressions, uh, poses. Uh, you can have two shots where you can have two characters and they're interacting with each other, so you have a better idea of their dynamic. You know, maybe one guy is the, um, you know, the, um, you know, he just likes to complain or he's just kind of like a bully, and the other person is just kind of his victim. He's the one who's always being bullied on. That just showcases more their their personality, their dynamic. Mm -hmm. What Brand what Brandon does here is like he switches it up. I mean, he, he's great with characters, but now he's showcasing a little bit about background design. He's creating a story moment. He's incorporating his characters into the scene, so now his background has context to the characters. So it almost looks like an artist book. Um, this is great too, where um, you know, typical story is like a story is a journey. You know, so. Um, Basically, you're showcasing your character going from one place to another. So here, they're traveling, and then they're, you're assuming they're going to the top of this palace. And now I'm assuming this is the top of the palace. So right away, using color and composition, you're kind of showcasing pretty much the emotion of what's happening. So, you know, it's very, everything is very still based on the, the coolness of the colors. And there's no action. It's very vertical. And then here, you have a dynamic pose. You're low to the ground. He's being surrounded by... Looks like these characters that are just laughing at him. It looks like it looks like a very Kubo and the two strings moment. Yeah. You know? uh, this is a color script where you know he's showcasing his color, but he's also showcasing his composition and his staging. So if you go from left to right, you see this nice progression. I'm not sure what this story is, but what it's telling me is like, okay, there's an older woman, she's an older lady, there's this peach, and it's very it's a nice, nice colors, it's peaceful, it's a very still moment. Uh, I'm assuming there's a connection here. This tells me this kid is somehow connected to the peach. Is he inside? I'm not sure. But, you know, this is his birth moment. It's kind of like this Nemo moment where he's still, it's the beginning of life, he's happy, uh, stars, it's very uh, celestial. Uh, I'm feeling this person is special. Okay, now we go to this third moment. Oops, sorry. We go to this third moment where now it's family. So now, you know, bright colors, they're hugging to each other. Okay, now he's on the journey. We're now, we're now in this moment. So now he's going off. And now here, he's further into his adventure. Now he's meeting people on the way. Okay, sorry about that. My 
interesting and tricky. So now he's meeting people on the way. Now, six panels in, he's already, you know, the colors are changing. Uh, the scope of the, of the camera is big. So now he's traveling somewhere. He's traveling somewhere maybe mysterious, maybe threatening. We don't know what it is. Uh, here he is. Now, now with colors, you're showcasing high contrast, high bright reds and blacks and oranges. Uh, things are just striking in contrast. And, and he's got an action pose. So now things have become quiet to not quiet. You know, there's contrast. And right away, they, they amplify with fire and high action. So we see a progression. We see in eight panels, you know, a color strip, but we also show showcase composition, a little bit of story. We see, we're seeing an adventure in front of our, in front of our eyes of what could be. Uh, and then, um, so yeah, all of this, was based on this story, the Momotoro story. So we did a lineup, exploration, some background studies, and, and moments, um, great compositions, color keys, and so forth. And then he changes the game. Then he talks about the Odyssey. OK, this isn't really a lineup, but it's pretty close to a lineup. You have all these characters in a boat. Mm -hmm. you, see, you see this tentacle. So it's like, OK, they're, so, you, know, you see this guy. You know, some are nervous, some are scared, some are frightened. Not this guy. This guy, this guy is, I'm assuming he's the hero of the story. So right away we have a page of exploration, maybe different design choices or possibilities. We have another page, uh, different possibilities. Maybe here's a new, another lineup of a different style take on it. Uh, here's a different, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a simple lineup on, on the helmet choices or possibilities. Uh, here's our woman character, so we get a sense of her personality. Uh, this looks like a huge troll or a, a villain. Okay, it's a Cyclops. So you get a sense of him. And then he changes it again. Now here's our third story that he's kind of introducing. So basically, we've got three stories and he's changing up the style, the range of what he can do. And this is just based on the third story character exploration. Uh, posters are great because posters it makes it, it looks it makes something look real. Anytime you have a poster, it kind of looks real. Like oh, it's, it's a movie that's gonna happen. <laughs> so here's here's his poster design, his story moment. Okay, now toward the end of the portfolio, he has a page of just a simple cricket. Um, this is just a different story altogether. But he's got this really simple cricket, which is beautiful. The store, the, the design is so simple, but you can see his wide range and an exploration of emotions, the, the the feelings, his reactions, you know, what the body's doing, how he's sitting, how he's standing. He's on twos, he's on fours, you know, really beautiful. And he's not crowding the page so much, you know. He's giving a little bit of breath with each pose, so we can enjoy each one on their own. So that's one thing too. You want to, you know, make sure you don't do. You don't want to overcrowd the page. Uh, here's another page on just this mouth character. But again, he's showing the wide range of the style. You see this guy on the upper left, very graphic, very UPA, where everything is enclosed in this one shape. And then he's got this other take where it's like, okay, maybe he's branching out the head and it's going beyond the the shape of the body. Here he is. He's magnifying the features of the ears. Um, and so forth. Um, and then here he is. He's putting both of these characters in little story moments. But now he's showcasing his environment. He's, he's showcasing his composition. Uh, here's, a, here's a page on birds. Here's a page on monsters. Here's a page on barbarians uh, and witches. And then, you know, he puts in a story moment based on that good witch story. And then he's got a nice page of like almost Samurai Jack looking style designs. More background. And that's it. So basically, you know, this is 28 pages. Right away, you really get a sense of what Brandon can do. I mean, great design, great compositions, character exploration, and great presentation. You know, every page isn't, isn't they're not competing with each other. You kind of <clears throat> enjoy each panel or each each design and enjoy it for what it is. It's really cool. 
Yeah. So that, I mean, I just I just tell people just like you know that's a good <laughs> template to kind of follow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't don't sure. exactly follow his design, but use <laughs> use his example as far as presentation. As what to show. Yeah, what to show yeah. and, and and the range of it. If you don't have locations and all you do is character designs, that's fine. But just kind of maybe try and showcase three different types of design. You know, say like, okay, here's a design on that's more uh, storybook. And then here's a design that's a little more fleshed out with volume, so it's more sculptural. And then here's a design that's more of a period piece. It's like, you know, uh, um, you know, your, you know, the features could be a lot more pushed and so forth. You, you're just, you want to showcase some kind of variety that you can adapt, that you have, that you have range. No, that's very cool. Yeah. And and because um, we we had a bit of a question about this, but I noticed there was some like story moments in that portfolio. And do you think yeah. people that work in biz dev have to do a bit of character design, a bit of backgrounds and a bit of story moments? Like, or do you think you can be a bit more, you can just be character or just be backgrounds or but, or do you think you need that uh, that breadth of, of uh, you know, different examples? Yeah, I think... Okay, if you're doing visual development, you don't necessarily have to do characters. When I say visual development, visual development is mostly like set design, uh, location design, and story moments where you're just kind of putting your characters in a scene. Uh, so, but usually those, you, the character designer is usually, you know, the person tasked with just creating all the character design. So there's usually that. Uh, so for me, uh, I usually put the design or what's already designed and I put it in the moment, you know, so I'm not, I'm not worried about the design. I'm just pretty much worried about the context of what that character is going to react to. So, you know, say like somebody's designed a, uh, a cat. So for me, I'll use that cat and I'll kind of like, you know, based on, I'll put them in context to what I'm putting them in the, in the story moment for. kind of like no and then it's like okay if I'm doing a story moment well it's like okay my story moment will probably my story moment will probably be is here the eyes are looking at guy hawking he's got a knife I don't know and maybe he's got that shadow so he's, the shadow is trapping him as well so, um, you know, so for VizDev, VizDev can include characters, but that's usually a character designer's job. And it also includes set and location design, which is one and the same. And it also includes props as well. But VizDev can also include uh, someone who is more focused on colors, who kind of like will just take the paintings and then they'll just add color to them. Uh, in some cases, <coughs> excuse me, you can also do story moments. And story moments are just kind of what, um, they're just kind of like, um, they're story pieces. They're kind of, they're kind of what this is. Let me show you what, what, um, what I mean. This is a good example of uh, Rebecca Shai's page. Rebecca Shai, uh, she was an in, a store, she was a sketch artist intern at Pixar, and then she did some work for uh, Onward. But I believe now she's at um, Netflix. But this would be a story moment where you have your character in the scene or in the set, and you're, you're telling a story in one in one panel. You know, this is a, this is also part of Vision Dev. Uh, another part of Vision Dev is when you do a three quarter down shot, and you're pretty much telling people where things are in the room. And and then these are call outs, so maybe you're you're kind of you're you know you're 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 kind of breaking up the set. Maybe you're calling out one specific thing in the set, and you're telling people it's like, well, what it is? What's that design? Like this tile work is this design? Um, what's the floor of tires on here? Could be this, so forth. You're just specific call outs on basically specific information on what that is in the scene. Uh, this would be an elevation shot, so. It's a flat-on shot of what the wall could be. So now you're giving scale to everything. This could be a specific design on this lunch box that's in here in the story. 
what Rebecca did here was she did these really small tonal thumbnails of what this is. So here she is. It looks like she had three ideas on how she was going to put this young lady on the kitchen floor. So she had this at first, and then this in the middle, and so forth. So if you look at the above shot, this is actually a combination of this and this pose. And then uh, here's a story moment of this young lady. Uh, looks like she has there's a book in her hand. So that book has some kind of significance. Uh, it looks like an Amelie moment. So something had to do with this photo booth. If I see this this the the tarp or the drapery, it's you know it looks like it's in the moment, like it's just been open. And this guy is running. So she's looking at this guy. Okay. So now there's a connection, right? There's something going on. There's something that has to do with him and her, and maybe she uh, she she likes them. Maybe she's too shy and doesn't, you know hasn't expressed her 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 feelings to him. But that he kind of sees her uh, elevation moments on the buildings. These are specific uh, storefronts. Uh, these are other moments. Ah, okay. Now they find love at the end. So basically, what she did was this would be expected for as a vision of artist. You'd be expected to design sets and then put them in story moments. So we have context of what that story is as far as the design, and then you have to do the call outs, especially for a CGI movie, because you have to sell it with a wow piece. And this is all production artwork. So basically, all of this stuff you give to a modeler, and they would build it based on all this. It was really cool work. Beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. What's great too is like uh, this is just one project. She has the Otheo project, which is just based on Van Gogh, which is nice. Really nice. She does her tonal, her tonal thumbnails. Really beautiful. Great tonals. Simple, clear. You know, this is beautiful. Calling out. You see the design, how everything's laid out. Uh, yeah, you get an idea of the world and the universe. On the style and the design, this is a nice moment. A lot of people are in the scene, but it's all about these two people. And how do you amplify that moment? Well, you compose them in this simple shape. You know, you, you put a backlight on it. So right away, if you blur your eye on this one piece, these two people stand out. This is what the story is about. These two people. All these all these people are secondary to these two. Yeah, I can see that in their little tonal thumbnails does a lot of dark against light, light against dark. Uh, exactly. Composition work. Yep. Exactly. So a lot of people, it's like they think it's all about like it's all the details and all and all that all that noise. No, a simple composition is the strongest. Simple works. You know, you don't need to put a lot of crap on there uh, because if you put a lot of crap on it without any design or meaning behind it, it just looks like you're forcing crap in there to make it look like something's happening. I I just think you know the the most simplest pieces work. Uh, yeah. Great, beautiful, nice and stark. This is very dramatic. Shadows, you know, high contrast, lights and dark, negative space. You know, nice quiet moment. Yeah. So yeah, this is just a great thing to use to do. She's got other way. Oh, did she post her onward? No, she didn't. Not yet. <laughs> Yeah. If you know the password, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I know. Unfortunately, <laughs> I know. Yeah. But, yeah. But, uh, but she's a great one to look at. There's a lot There's a lot of great other ones, too. But, yeah, she's great. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've got a couple of other questions. Um, sure. Uh, hey, John, could you tell me more techniques like the 180 line and types of shots everyone should know about? Uh, sure. Let's see. Let's see. Let's look into <laughs> my... Uh, I'm going to see, I, I, you know, I've done past uh, workshops where I kind of have uh, one, do I have it here? 180. I probably, it's probably included in a, okay, maybe it's in here. I've done a lot of workshops, so I kind of like, I've kind of talked about things before, so I kind of throw them in something and I'm like, oh, well, rather than just kind of, maybe I can just show you what I've, what I've done. And I know if um if anyone's interested on uh, John's Facebook page, I know you've got a few little projects you've got on there, don't you? That you've kind of uh, compiled over the years, and and people can complete. 
Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I've got. Uh, you got the treasure you know, one, I, and I have the treasure one. Uh, I'll bring that up as well. But uh, here's the 180 line. Okay, here it is. So, oh, let's see the 180 degree. Uh, I'll just quickly go through this. Hopefully, it'll, it'll answer the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, cool. That, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that the person may have had. So basically, the 180 line is basically when you have two or more people. Uh, but for this point, maybe there's two people. And there, you, you imagine there's a line between them, and we'll call it an axis line. So there's a line between these two folks. And then what happens is you want to make sure on one side of that line is where you want to put the camera on. You don't want to cross that line because then all of a sudden you've crossed the 180. The 180 just implies it's 180 degrees of the half circle that you've laid out. So, uh, so basically we have character A on the left, character B on the right. And if you look at the arc of the, of, the, of the camera, the camera is on one side of this axis. So here's uh, people A and B, and we have B in a dark, in a dark uh, shirt to, set, to set, uh, help uh, uh, distinguish them. So if you look at the bottom right, you see that there's three camera positions. There's actually four camera positions, but there's one that's kind of in red, Red is implying it's a mid shot of the two characters. Okay, now we're over the shoulder on A, looking at B. Again, we're on this side of the camera line. Okay, now we're on the third camera, over the shoulder character B, looking at A. So right away, we haven't crossed the camera line. This is all makes sense because we've established that character A is on the left. Character B is on the right. So we can go to any of these cameras and it still tells us uh, character A is on the left, camera, uh, character B is on the right. But look what happens when we cross the line. Now all of a sudden we flop these people. So now if we did this in the middle of the scene and we first told people like character A is on the right, I'm sorry, character A is on the left, character B is on the right, and then we did this scene, all of a sudden the audience would be like, well, wait a minute, did they just flip positions? Did they, you know, it becomes jarring. So the only reason we have uh, the 180 rule, it just helps establish where our camera is and where our people are at in, in, in context to each other. So that's the whole idea of the 180. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna quickly that makes good sense. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. But if not, maybe if, if uh, whoever had the question, if they wanted to email me, I'll show my email at the end. But if they have an email, if they want further information, they can always email me and I could uh, um, uh, answer that. I'm just going to quickly go through this. This is very old. <laughs> this is a cool job. <clears throat> I think one thing about when you show your boards that I think students have a bit of trouble with is, is – the real uh, clarity you have in the in the story that you're trying to show, you know, I always uh -huh. feel like whenever I'm looking over students' stuff, it and, and they've just started boarding. It's always like there's lots of confusing stuff. I'm always like, what's happening here? What's going on here? How does this work? Yeah. How does that work? But but when you look at someone who's really good at boarding, it's just very clear. Um, and yeah. like, do you have any tips for that? I, I guess it's all just practice, right? But um, um it's practice, but um. Basically, it is practice, but I tell people keep things simple. Um, here's actually, I will um, I will show this. Okay, uh, are you guys familiar with I Love Lucy? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, the, sh yeah. the show. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for, it, for it might be a bit old. It might be a bit old for some of our clientele here, John. But yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so in, in, in a nutshell, I Love Lucy was this very popular show in the late '50s and early '60s. It was Lucille Ball. And she was very funny. In fact, I'll just play like maybe 15 seconds of this, just so people have an idea.
I'll just let this play for about 20 seconds. That way you kind of get the idea of the sequence. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that was really popular uh, in, the, in the late 50s. Uh, so I used this example uh, to explain the simple camera setup. Um, this was one of the first earlier uh, successful sitcoms. And so basically, everything was pretty much in this living room. And you had a three camera setup. You had one camera to the right of the stage, one to the left of the stage, and one to the center. So all of these can dolly and, and pan. And they were all pretty much at eye level. So you had this three camera setup. Uh, it was pretty no frills. It was very basic, but it worked. And this would be the view of the camera setups from above. Okay. So knowing this three camera setup, you can now uh, simply tell the story in the most econ econ uh, economic way. I know a lot of people, they kind of say like, well, what camera should I use? You know, and a lot of people go crazy on it. And you have to know, like, you know, simple always works. Uh, just keep things simple. And you always want to move the camera only if you have a reason to move it or to show something. So let's do this example. Say we have, uh, uh, you know, just a nice simple flat scene and we have two, two young people and they're talking. Uh, and then, you know, just, I threw someone in the foreground so you know it was across the street. So then you have these two people talking and then this shot is just a cut in of this shot. Okay, nothing simple. You just, it's just a tighter cut on this one. Okay, now let's vary the camera and let's do an over the shoulder of these two people. So now we have this over the shoulder and we have this over the shoulder. Okay, now what if we wanna do the same thing but we just wanna showcase one of those people? Fine, this shot is just a cut in of this shot. And this shot is just a cut in of this shot. Okay, now what if we want to do a straight on shot of one of those characters? So now it looks like we're the other person talking to this person. So right away, we now have just a very simple, but very, we're getting a wider range of the possibilities of the camera. So now from here, you can now story tell. So you can go like this, and I'll just make it up. Say, hi, Karen. Hi, Jane. How are you? I'm fine. Hey, did you go to school? Yeah. So what was school about? Oh, I don't know. They had homework. Really? Yeah. But I don't think I did very, very well. But what do you mean? Well, you know, I, I just, I just didn't study. Oh, you didn't study? Yeah. But, you know, maybe I will. Yeah. But you know what? I think, you know, who likes you? What? Yeah. He told me that he's interested in seeing you. Oh my God, really? Yes. But, oh my God, here he comes. So right away. <laughs> That's so awesome, John. <laughs> I just, I, 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 all I did was I just reused shots and I just cut back and forth. So it looked like there was a lot happening, but there wasn't because you guys were still focused on the story. But what I did was I just changed things up a bit only when I had to, you know? Um, but you don't necessarily have to cut through all these things. You can just keep things simple. You know, I could have had everything 
told in this one shot. There would have been nothing wrong with that, but it would have been boring. You know, yeah. I could have, you know, I could have added maybe this. I could have just used these two, and that would work fine. You know, but just a little bit of variety kind of helps to keep things interesting. When I wanted to amplify that moment, like, hey, I think he likes you. Oh, he did. So I wanted to hit up her eyes, <laughs> right, you know, right there in her face. And then the moment, like, oh my God, here he comes. Well, now I'm set, I'm prompting that he's coming over to, around the corner. So hopefully that helps. Just keep things simple. And if you look at like your TV shows, sitcoms, uh, movies, pay attention to a scene. And they do exactly this. They usually use three shots. You use a wide shot. And then from that wide shot, they probably cut in a little closer. And then from there, they do over the shoulders. And that's pretty much what they use for the most part. So uh, you think you're seeing a lot, but you're not. It's just very simple and economic. Uh, and here's an exercise. If I may, I'll share this exercise that people can do. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So here's the dialogue. If you guys want to take a picture of this, uh, that'd be great. Uh, this is your. This is the scenario. You have two men who are sitting for dinner. Okay. Uh, one of the people will call A, the other person B. So A says hi. B says hello. A says, sorry, I'm late. B says, you're 40 minutes late. A says, yeah, I had a lot of work at the office. And then A again says, sorry. So how many ways can we board that? Well, I did three versions. Um, here's one version. Hi. Hello. Sorry, I'm late. You're 40 minutes late. Yeah, I had a lot of work at the office. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so I did not move the camera. I have the camera locked, and all these, all he did was he he walked in, he sat down, and they just had their conversation. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that shot. You know, you're still telling the story. They're still acting, reacting. It's very subtle. You know, there's not a lot, a lot of performance going on, except for when he bows his head. You know, that's kind of like the prompt is like, oh, he sunk in and he feels bad about it. That's one version. Here's another version. What if we change things up a bit? Hi. Hello. Sorry, I'm late. You're 40 minutes late. Yeah, uh, I had a lot of work at the office. Sorry. So there I added a little over the shoulder shot. I also made him a little bigger just to amplify, you know, that he's the one who just feels bad and he makes this guy feel low. And I paint it smaller, you know, a little bit smaller. He's, he's taking more space. You, you go from him, and then you cut to this two shot. And then he bows his head. Sorry. Here's a third version, our last version. Comes in. Hi, sorry I'm late. You're 40 minutes late. Yeah, I had a lot of work at the office. Sorry. So uh, I did over the shoulders. What I did was I chose not to show his face, but I wanted to showcase, you know, something to just amplify that he's not happy. So, you know, arms crossed, not moving, you know, that, that, that in itself is, 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 has a very, you know, that, that, that says things, something without showing a person's face. So now uh, another thing you want to do is you can totally change the dialogue and it has a different version, you know. Um, you can go like this. Say the guy A, um, say he's late, but you know how previously I had him feeling guilty? Well, you can make him a jerk. And you can say, hi. Hello. Yeah, sorry I'm late. Yeah, but you're 40 minutes late. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I had a lot of work the officer, right? Sorry. <laughs> so when, when, you, yep. when you change the context of how he's saying it, then you have a different meaning of what, how the story is going to be, you know? Uh, and then, you know, you have opportunities there to kind of showcase that with acting, performance, composition, all that stuff. So, uh, let's see. Well, I'm not sure what's after this. Uh, I always forget. Okay, that. Yeah, that was the end of that. So, basically, um, you know, that, that, this could be like a simple exercise if you guys want to take your hand at, at doing a very simple, you know, exploration on storyboards, or at least kind of using the camera uh, and so forth. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think it was that kind of your note about the clarity in terms of just keeping things simple. Don't try and get too overcomplicated with different camera shots and moves and all sorts of stuff. Just, yeah, just keep things simple. 
Exactly. Yeah. Keep it simple. Simple always works. And a lot of people think like they have to be fancy and like, oh, I have to do this and that. No, 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 no. Just keep it simple. Um, if I if I if I make something, can I show this one scene? Yeah, go for it. Yep. Okay. Um, I always use this scene too. Um, are you not entertained? I'm not going to show the whole thing, but I'm just going to show the beginning setup. I want to make sure I get the right one. Um, I always I want to make get the one that's not cropped. Uh, let's see, I think it's this one. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, oh, what's the favorite? I'm not I would love to add the favorite. Okay, so we're going to do this. Let me uh, magnify here. Okay. So, I don't think we're uh, going to get I'm, sound from your computer, though, John. Does that matter? Oh, oh no. Let's see. How about? Can you hear it? No. You're not. Oh, okay. Oh, let's see. Let's see. I'm wondering if I do this. I'm gonna. Uh, what if I do this? I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna take. And let's see. I'm gonna. Oh, your default microphone has changed to built-in microphone. What if I do this? Yeah, we can hear it. Okay. Good. Okay, I just switched off uh, my sound settings. Yeah, so, yeah. So basically, I, I'm sure most people have seen Gladiator, but I wanted to show this scene. I'm not going to show the whole scene because the second half gets a lot of, you know, you know what happens. He just pretty much kills everybody. But we're going to look at this scene, and I want you to look at the scene, and I want to ask yourself as you're looking at this, what's the composition? And ask yourself, why did Ridley Scott choose those compositions? So here we go. Okay, so I'm going to backtrack. I'm going to turn the sound off so we can kind of talk through this. So basically, uh, let's see, here we go. Let's go to the beginning. Okay, we start with a flat shot. We get strong verticals, and then we have a colonnade of, uh, of these, uh, these warriors. And, you know, they're all looking at each other. But we have this one figure back to the camera, and the camera trucks in. But we have a little mystery. We haven't seen the face yet. So we have strong verticals. It's very symmetrical. And all of a sudden, we... cut we do a reverse cut reverse cut means when the camera just flops over and now you reveal who this character is now this character stands up and walks to our camera very symmetrical anytime you have someone symmetrically placed in the picture it could be someone of uh who is benevolent one of authority uh it could be a good guy bad guy he's commanding the space so everything is all about him because he's in the center of everything so in this case he stands up he's different than everybody else because they're sitting so he's there. Now what's happening as he's walking by? Um, they're saluting him. So right away, and right away, if when we cut to this scene, this is his POV, his point of view, and it's still symmetrical, and they're they're bowing and they're 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 you know they're giving him respect. Now we have an upshot as he passes camera. And then we have this, it seems like an over-the-shoulder, it's very dark. And then you reveal these big, huge guys, scary guys with weapons. Okay, it's very eye level. But look what happens here. You go from here to here. Okay. The camera is low. There's one of him, and there were five of him. But why did Ridley choose this shot? Well, the reason is, you know, this is like 40 minutes into the movie. And we've shown that, you know, there was like uh, two battles that went before. He's a great warrior. And this is a hero shot. So right away, Ridley wanted to portray him as a giant. And then you go from here and look at the cut after this. You go back to the eye level. You get to the five big guys with weapons and they take a step back. It's almost like a wave just went right through them. So right away, 
And then you cut back to this hero shot. The camera's even lower. He's a giant. Petals are falling on him. Look at the spikes behind him. So right away, Ridley chose this to psychologically tell us that this guy is bigger than life and he's to be reckoned with. You know, he's just, just a very brave figure, great warrior, and so forth. And then from there, the scene continues where it's eye level. He bows before he starts to kill him. So, yeah. <laughs> so again, the choices of camera and what the camera can do, what, you know, what, what's, what it's the information of what you're trying to say, but also the emotion behind it. What are you trying to say, you know, in context or subcontext or, you know, emotionally? trying to say well you can't really say it all but that really goes back to some of the shapes that you were drawing early on yeah it just i'm uh, just kind of using simple shapes to just kind of compose things you know um yeah i don't i don't i try not to get fancy i just try and keep things as simple as possible so yeah but uh yeah there's just a lot of um you know i always tell people look at um you want to try and see as many movies as you can but that's kind of unrealistic because a lot of people don't have time to look at a lot of movies. So I tell people, look at scenes in movies. Uh, scenes in movies are just mini movies within a movie. And every scene has a buildup. Um, it has a beginning and a middle and an end. And it always has some kind of buildup. There's always something being revealed. It could be information being revealed. It could be discovery, a revelation, uh, the surprise, something. Something is being revealed. So you want to just look at scenes and see what they tell you. Um, so yeah, let's see. I'm gonna just see what scenes I have here. I'm always surprised what I still have left here. Uh, let's see, cool. Let's see, where are my movies? Movies, action scenes. Yeah, I have Spectre. I have Anchorman for something funny. Uh, <laughs> Batman action, car abduction, carousel, castaway, close encounters, die hard. Uh, Disney's Mulan, Gladiator, Good uh, Godfather, Goodfellas. Uh, this is always a good scene. Um, this is uh, Game of Thrones. This is uh, I think it's Arians getting uh, killed. But I'm gonna turn the sound off. But just look what the visuals tell you. So. I'll just play this for like 30 seconds. But she's there. Okay, she's hungry. You see the birds. Okay. So you see the crowd kind of walking past her. You know, just her actions tell you that she's trying to be, uh, you know, out of view. She's asking this guy for some bread. And he's pretty much telling her just kind of like, you know, get out of here. He says, piss off, and then he walks off. So everybody's walking. She doesn't know what's going on. You know, all, all of her attention has been focused on, on she's hungry. She's just really hungry. So the kids tell her what's happening. Okay, close up on her. She drops the bird. So now it's not about hunger anymore. Something's happening. So now she's gonna go find out. So the camera is with her. She's with the crowd. She makes her way past the crowd. We don't know what she's seeing yet. And then all of a sudden, you see the camera is low. Now the camera goes up and it slowly reveals what she sees. Where you see the courtyard, everybody's gathered. See King Joffrey in his court and here comes her dad. Slow reveal on her dad, crowd reacts. And then all of a sudden, he sees her daughter. The camera pans up dramatically. You see her reaction. Now it's about them. They know each other. They know they're there. The crowd's reacting. He tells his soldier about his daughter. So he's being led up. There's King Joffrey, upshot, commanding in power. That's Joffrey's bride. Uh, 
So just you, seeing the visuals and what they tell you, the information. You see Joffrey there. He's higher than than than, than the guy than he is. Um, there's your establishing shot. You see the crowd onto the onto uh, the stage. Then you get to one shots on the characters as they're saying dialogue or the reaction, acknowledgments, and so forth. Here he is. He's telling people that yeah, he he was planning to 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 uh, take over Joffrey. So uh, he's asking for forgiveness. So as you speed up, let's see. Let me speed up here. So. So he's asking for, for mercy. A rock gets hit on his head. So let me speed up here. So here's the, um, um, it's just someone on the court saying, you know, he's explaining uh, that he's asking for forgiveness and he's asking King Joffrey, should we forgive him? You know, should we, should we, should we give him mercy? So then you go up to Joffrey. He's, he's, he's in the moment. He knows, you know, he's the king. He, this is what he wants. He loves that power and fame. So he's acting very uh, cordial at this point. But then let me put on the dialogue. Sansa has begged mercy for her father. But they have the soft hearts of women. So long as I am your king, Treason shall never go unpunished. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. Okay. Now. okay, so now he wants him killed. So now look what the camera does. Now things get very dramatic. Things were very quiet. Now all of a sudden things are tense, very dramatic. Look what the camera does. The camera's turning. Fast acting. Okay, now we have these moments here. Um, anytime the director wants to show uh, internal thinking, uh, what someone is thinking, they usually will freeze the frame, everything grows quiet, and then you have a close-up of your character, and then they're looking at something. So this is kind of like we're internally inside this person's voice or mind, and he's, he knows he's about to get killed. So now he's just kind of, he, he knows his, his death is near. His daughter's gone. He feels alone. And then you cut on the birds. What's interesting is that we began this whole sequence with birds and we finished with birds. So it has a poetic <laughs> beginning and ending. So it's very dramatic, and but right away in this one scene, you see the buildup. You see the the tension, and, and then the information given, and then how things just happened right away. So um, yeah, I mean, this is what you can do when you look at scenes: study scenes, see, see the beginning, and see how they escalate. The information being shown, and then the choices visually of what they're showing you. So it's really cool, John. Yeah, thanks for sharing all of that. Oh, you're welcome. So, yeah, I just, you know, um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch to, uh, Harry Potter scenes are great. Uh, let's see. Harry Potter 4, uh, Matrix, Princess Bride, Pulp Fiction, you know, the Kahuna scene. <laughs> this is a great one. I'm not going to show everything, but just a hey, second. How you doing? So you guys know what's happening here, but it's like you know, there's you know, just study a lot of scenes and 
Um, you know, if anyone needs suggestions, I can definitely give you like a starter kit. I can give you like 20 things to look at, but there's a lot. Road to Perdition, Saving Private Ryan, Take This Waltz, uh, Devil Wears Prada, Six Sense, Incredibles, Up, you know, there's a whole bunch. Yeah. So um, would you say a good exercise to do is like uh, people, you know, sketching out the scenes and stuff? Is that a good exercise to do? You can if you want. I mean, um, you know, definitely nothing wrong with that. You know, if, if it helps you kind of uh, sketch out the scene, I would say, yeah, if you're going to sketch out the scene, sketch it out economically and uh, and then maybe just study the choices of like, okay, what's where's the focal point? Um, you know, maybe study the cuts. You know, they showed you this and then they showed you that. Maybe ask yourself, well, why did they do this and do that? You know, maybe there was a truck in where the camera was trucking in on something and it was magnifying the relevance of, of one element in that scene. Um, who knows? Uh, you know, it's all about what's happening in the scene. What what What's important about this scene? Every scene in a movie is there for a reason because, you know, a movie is usually 90 minutes, two hours. And so it's important that something is left in. So something was left in for a reason. And usually because there's a bit of information, there's a revelation, a discovery, uh, you see a character uh, turn or a character growth, something. And so you want to try and figure out, well, what what is it that was there? And, you know, and, you know, the directors, they, they, they put these scenes in and they may or may not indirectly, directly, they're trying to tell you something there that they want you to, to hold on to, take away. So, yeah. So there's a lot. Another great thing to look at too is um, commercials are great as far as like buildups. Uh, trailers and movies are great. Um, yeah, M music videos are great. Uh, I should try to think. I, I haven't seen this in a while. I have so much. Uh, <laughs> Mulan, Paris, Patton, the beginning scene of Patton. Um, trailers, Karate Kid, War Games. Two days ago, I saw a game. I, know, oh, I, I got two things playing. Sorry. <laughs> Want to get out of here? Yeah, I mean, this is just a quick scene. This, I, I just did this just for a class for a truck-ins. Two days ago, I saw a vehicle at a mall, I think. You want to get out of here? Okay. So, yeah, I've just, you know, after over the years, I've acquired, like, little uh, um, references and scenes I like, you know, things for drama. Uh, animatics that I've gathered. Uh, Oscar montages are good. Uh, but yeah, I can definitely share, share, share these with you, Simon, later on. Maybe I can uh, send a few and, and, and maybe if, uh, you know, if there's somewhere that could be made available to the to the audience, yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, we can do something. We had a question about, like, um, someone was asking, um, <clears throat> is there much opportunity for doing storyboarding in live action movies? There is. I mean, I think a lot, most movies do have a storyboard artist on there. But the thing is, it's different. Um, what I've seen, I haven't really, I haven't worked in live action. I did a live action short a long time ago. But basically, the difference is for live action, it's mostly uh, you're doing setup. You're doing, uh, you're just pretty much setting up the shot. You're setting up the camera. You're placing where the characters are to each other. And you're just kind of telling, you're just you're just setting up the shot so you probably wouldn't go so much as say like in a storyboard like you know showing this person get closer to each other basically the the, the actors will do that you know so you want to you don't want to tell them how to do their job you're just kind of staging stuff that's pretty much what a live action storyboard person would do they would pretty much stage things uh they would set things up for camera you know um, so you're not really focused more on the act on the acting uh, or the inner cuts of things so much. Right. So you're just kind of blocking. You're what you're doing is you're you're just blocking a shot. Now for animation, you would do the whole thing. You would kind of be focused more on the whole um, um, 
see. Let's see. I would be, let's see. Let's see storyboards, animatics. Let's see if I can get it going for you. Okay, my name is Hiro Hamada, and as you can probably tell, I, I never set out to be a superhero. I mean, it's not exactly a regular life for a 14 year old kid. But I guess I've never been what you call a regular kid. I was a little different right from the start. And Cass, you gotta see this. At school, I kind of stuck out too. So that's an example. Another example would be, uh, let's see if I can, uh, I'll show you something from Zootopia. I have it. Let's see, Zootopia, is it this one? Oh yeah. Oh, what did I do? Sorry about that. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Let's do Zootopia again. There it is. And I will magnify that. So yeah, I mean, it's just a great animatic and so forth. So yeah, for, for animation, you'd be more involved as far as the composition, the scene. You're pretty much, you're directing. You're directing with a pencil. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Um, and then this, all, all of this, and there's a few others. All of these I got on YouTube. So if you go on YouTube, put in like Zootopia deleted scenes, and you should be able to find these. Uh, those are great ones. I do the same thing for Toy Story. Pretty much, um, I found better luck if you like put in a movie, 
um, put in deleted scene and either put storyboard, animatic, or real, R-E-E-L. And more times than not, you'll have better luck finding animatic, storyboard, stuff like that. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, you'll find a lot of these inside outs I found, uh, yeah, I found uh, on uh, HTTYD, How to Train Your Dragon. A lot, uh, all of these are on YouTube. So, yeah. Yeah, so people can check those out. Very cool. Yeah. Well, we're almost running out of time. Well, we have kind of run out of time. But do you want to uh, do you want to finish up with one last cat drawing, John? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, let's see, I know what I'll do, but I will say. And yeah, thanks for hanging out with us for a while. I think uh, I think you taught like a ten week course in an hour and a half. <laughs> no, I just I mean I'm just I'm just lucky right now where I I can I'm you know I love talking to to young folks out there and and older folks too who want to get into this and I encourage you guys. I I started when I was late, and uh, I you know I I think I told you I was a math major when I was. Uh, well, I was I was gonna be a math major, mm -hmm. and then in my in my second year of college, I, I got kicked out. I flunked out, and I was depressed and sad. And a lot of my friends had moved on and graduated, and they were doing their thing. They were like in engineering and uh, doing stuff like that. And I had no idea what I wanted to do, and I felt like a loser. I kept I was comparing myself to them, and I I just didn't know what to, what I wanted to do. But um, um, yeah, I just. Uh, I just kind of, I took a junior college class and I took, I did drawing to, to cheer myself up, but I would like do odd jobs. And I, you know, when I was 31 years old is when I saw, I saw about this training program at Disney TV and that's how I got in. So I got in late, but I'm so glad I did what I did because I appreciate it more. So, um, yeah. you know, it's, don't worry about age. It's all about what's in your book. It's all about what you can deliver. And um, just because you graduate from high school or college, uh, you're always gonna keep learning. I have to keep learning. I have to, I have to learn things every day, every week, because I'm competing against you guys. You know, you guys are younger, faster, <laughs> and cheaper. So I have to be on my game, and I have to learn uh, you know, new stuff. Uh, when I was your age, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have uh, the internet or anything, all, all of these resources in front of us. So uh, you guys, there's stuff out there. You guys should absorb it and look at movies. Look at movies before CGI. Uh, what CGI tends to do is they get, you know, they become a little gratuitous and they kind of show stuff and they showcase the monster or, or all the special effects and stuff like that. And it's like, that's nice. But if you go to movies before CGI, they were a lot more creative and economical as far as showing stuff if you remember alien the first alien movie you never saw the alien until the last 10 minutes yeah, yeah. but there was you were scared as hell throughout the whole thing mm -hmm. why because you were you were you were reacting to what the folks were reacting you're like what's that shadow what's that silhouette you know the noise and everything there put you on edge and you didn't need to see the monster but you felt the monster that That's is right. power as far as what you can do with movies and setups and cameras and so forth same thing for jaws you didn't really see the shark until toward the end that was an accident that was a blessing because the shark kept falling apart so <laughs> uh spielberg had to be economical and he had a limit showing the shark because if he showed too much of the shark you knew that it was a piece of crap so <laughs> he didn't show it, what he did was he didn't show the shark as much and he put the camera right above the water to make the viewer think you were in the water. So there was that implied fear. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just economic shortcuts like that, or just kind of, you know, the limitations that were set upon, you get more economic, more creative as far as showcasing what you can do. So, uh, yeah, just be a sponge, look at movies, try and see scenes every day, uh, maybe two or three, you know, look at them, turn the sound off, uh, study the props you know the actions the reactions uh the choices 
Look at what the camera's doing. Why is it moving? Why are we trucking in? Why are we trucking out? How did it begin? How did it end? What did we learn? What's the takeaway? Um, you know, look at comedies and so forth. Even comedies have setups and buildups and, and, and revelations and, and stuff like that. So um, yeah, explore it all. Just because you're doing art for film, you're doing, you should know what film is. Film is, is it's like visual language, it's storytelling. So you should understand what film is. Film, in, in a nutshell, is story structure. It's, it's an, it's a, it could be a journey that's emotional, physical, psychological. Someone's going from A to B. A lot of things happen along the way. Things escalate. There's a lot of things that it, the whole idea about story, uh, or at least a good story, is it's the journey. Things are there to make it harder for the person to get what they want. And so um, the, all of these challenges, you're going, you're going on to the challenge. So you have to you know, reveal what the stakes are, show the stakes, show the struggles, the challenges. So that way, when you see someone who's down, when they do get up, that up is much more higher than you want. You know, to have a good high, you need a good low. So you want to showcase contrast and, and these, these journeys and these steps to kind of get you to that high moment of where you want the hero to be. So that that's just story structure, story beats, it's a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a spit tape. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, just kind of look at films and just absorb it. So, yeah. No, it's great. Yeah, thanks, John. And uh, what we might do is you've got a few people asking about questions about shorts and trailers and animatics, but what I might do is uh, send you over a link and you can put a few of those things in there and then we yeah. can put it up on the, um, the CDW Facebook page and, and people can have access to them. That sounds good. And you know what? Before we leave, I'm going to share my uh, my email. So in case anybody has any questions, you can shoot me an email. And I'll share my screen right now. I'm just going to uh, write it for folks. And I will share my screen if people want to just take a picture of it. So there I am. It's JP uh, Nevarez 34 at yahoo.com. So yeah, if you guys have any questions or anything, just let me know and I'd be more than happy to, to answer if I can. Thanks, John. You're welcome. So yeah, thank you, Simon. I just really enjoyed this and hopefully people got something out of it. And, and if you didn't, or if you want more information, shoot me an email. <laughs> I'm sure they did. And yeah, it was great catching up again. So um, thank you. Great and uh, thanks everyone for tuning into the stream and we'll see you guys next week. All right. Sounds thank good. You. Bye guys. Thank you.